Well, we're back here uh, ongoing at the poster session, uh, Friday morning, Yule are, and it's my privilege to be with Professor Peter Taylor from the Kennedy Institute of Rheumatology in London. Peter, it's a pleasure to get together with you and see you again. Great the last time I saw you in Miami, and it was an interesting evening, which we won't really get into. No, but, we better not. <laughs> yeah. But how's this meeting been so far? I imagine very crazy and hectic for you. It's extremely busy, but lots of exciting new clinical data. So much, actually, you can't take it all in. But a lot of advances um, in terms of using current therapies optimally, but also in terms of new therapies that are coming down the pike. So very exciting. I mean, it's, it's almost like being a kid in a, in a candy store in terms of where do you go with treatment. Absolutely. And I think that's the dilemma that many of us in practice have, is what treatments do you choose? I mean, historically we've chosen the anti-TNFs as our first group of drugs, but maybe that's going to change because we've got all these new treatments and I don't know that we should be trapped into this old paradigm. What's your opinion? Well, I think that's absolutely right, but we have to remember that when you take into account what the best drug is for an individual, you need to look at the benefits of the drug, the toxicities of the drug, and also these days the cost effectiveness is absolutely crucial. So a major disadvantage of the whole biologic class is that they're currently very costly. Well, there has to be said that market pressures and the biosimilars emerging are probably going to drive that price down. But as there are strong hints that the small molecules are emerging too, the expectation is well, hopefully they'll be competitively priced. We've yet to see what yeah, the case is. Be... Um, but if they are, um, some of the data looks compelling. So we live in interesting times. Anti-TNS, I have to say, remain supreme in my mind in terms of inhibiting structural damage to joints. And so, of course, if we could define which patients were most at risk of structural damage progression, uh, you would target the therapy to those individuals. So, so you bring up the point, and, and I was just talking to Charles Perothy, in which you know, he felt that the explosion that we see around us in the use of imaging tools is because of the advent of biologics. And I made the counter argument, well, I don't know what came first, the chicken or the egg. It's like if you look at bone density, how bone density allowed a lot of treatments to develop. And I think ultrasound and MRI are also giving a lot of impetus to all these treatments. Right. Because what you just said, structure is what it's all about. Well, well certainly that's one aspect. Um, the technology for ultrasound and MRI has moved on at a tremendous pace. And so what we can do with modern hardware is extraordinary. But here are the issues that if you look at radiographic destruction in the traditional way, by a plain radiography, which of course is a technology over 100 years old now, um, that what you see at a cohort level is a, a linear progression over time. And so when the um, very nice drug rep knocks on your door and shows you their uh, information sheet for their drug, what they'll show you is a straight line progression for radiographic damage and say you give my biologic X and you'll get a flat line and stop that progression. But that linear progression at a cohort level hides a multitude of data because what it fact it reflects on an individual patient level is about 75% of patients are not progressing at all and the mean progression is driven by a 25% minority or thereabouts. And if we were, could define that minority, of course, we would know how to target treatments more rationally. And we can do that now, both with MRI and with ultrasound. Um, ultrasound in the hands of a, a skilled operator doesn't take very long to do. Uh, it's very acceptable to patients, it's not a recurring cost for uh, the equipment itself. Um, MRI is also an extremely good way of looking at, at joint damage, particularly osteitis. Um, it's one downside, however, is that it's a costly imaging technology and, and therefore it's not necessarily accessible to every outpatient Although, clinic. And it was interesting to look at Charles Pettifee's uh, paper that we co-authored, is the, the value of extremity MRI, which is obviously much cheaper and more right. accessible to the full-size magnet, it's very comparable and, and rheumatologists don't need to be neurologists. We don't need to look at dendritic cells in the brain. So if we can see osteitis with extremity MRI, and use that as a biomarker, I personally think that would be, you know, a very valuable. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think there are some other issues, perhaps we might um, drill down some further detail on this discussion, because of course osteitis is um, inflammation in, in the bone and, and in the bone marrow. And what we've learned is that that's probably one of the single best predictors of subsequent erosive damage. But we also know that not all patients with osteitis will progress to radiographic erosions. So there's this slight tension of knowing which particular lesions are which. And one really needs to understand the pathophysiological correlates of the, immuno, immuno, uh, the imaging abnormality. Uh, and that perhaps brings us on to other advances that are taking place around various software programs that actually look at the way one would evaluate inflammation in a joint. 
and many of the traditional ways of doing it just by a binary assessment is there osteitis as yes or no and of course RAMRIS which is a very useful and validated measure doesn't look at cartilage at all can we actually look at the biology of the synovium and what's really going on and if we had a software that would tell us something about the different vascular biology of uptake of contrast maybe that would give us a clue as to which patients were really going to erode or not now this is still much in the research domain uh, but there are some very exciting software packages one I'm aware of is, is Dynamica which dissects out the uptake curve for uh, contrast in patients who have dynamic contrast MR and this tells you something about different types of endothelial biology with each curve that's defined within the overall uptake curve and uh, I think research in this area is very exciting and might give us a much better handle in the future as to which patients are really going to progress well rapidly. I mean because you know one of the things that you said earlier is we don't know what treatments to utilize I mean right. we've got this whole choice and, and, and I know that there's been a lot of conversation also that maybe rheumatoid arthritis is one disease, two diseases, or three diseases, and maybe synovitis occurs in some people, and osteitis in the others, and maybe some drugs like maybe a B-cell modulator is better for osteitis, and maybe a TNF inhibitor for synovitis. So could you conceive that these imaging tools could actually help us make choices? Well, I think they can in a number of different domains, but we should be very clear about which they are. Um, so you're, you're quite right, uh, rheumatoid arthritis is a syndrome, it's not a disease, it's a syndrome. There are many different subtypes that we're well aware of. And the most obvious one is ACPAR positive versus ACPAR negative, and we know that they respond differentially to treatment intervention. But in terms of using imaging as some kind of stratification marker, which I think is already with us, that if you can define people with a certain threshold level of metabolic activity in the joint, which is coupled to the process of tissue destruction, and you can do this by MR or by power Doppler ultrasound, then you can segregate the patients into those who have a very high likelihood of progression and those who don't. And, and uh, one of the pieces of research we're working on is exactly this, that we think we can already make that segregation with a high degree of accuracy. What we can't do currently, to the best of my knowledge, is on an individual patient basis predict with accuracy what their subsequent course will be. But we can give a probability and this allows us to use expensive therapies in a much more cost-effective way. So on that subject, <coughs> I think we've kind of done fairly well in making an early diagnosis and buying into the fact that we should treat patients early and aggressively. I think most people would agree with that. Absolutely. The problem we've got is we don't know when to stop treatment and we don't know how to measure remission and yeah. what is remission. Yeah. So something like dynamic contrast that you, that you had, have yes. experienced, will that maybe give us a little more help in really finding out which patients can I stop treatment on? I think that's absolutely right, but equally we have to be aware of the fact that the costs of doing dynamic contrast MRI would make it prohibitive in everyday practice for every patient. But in the context of research studies or maybe some subpopulations of patients where there are real questions about a disconnect between um, composite scores of disease activity that suggests remission, but it's clear their functional decline is inexorable, then we need to know what we're treating. Absolutely. A and that would be a perfect way to do it. But even if you, if you look at the eco economics, and I'm not an economist by any uh, stretch of the imagination, but I know that the cost on an annual basis of the biologics, so whatever the cost of a, an MRI every six months with dynamic contrast, if that could save 10% of the patients continuing with the right. treatment, maybe the cost, in fact, would be very actually favorable. Well, I agree, and I think there's a real need to do some studies to show just that. Yeah. Uh, I think it's a completely sensible hypothesis, and uh, I would be astonished if that wasn't the case, but we need to show it. I have one more question in, in terms of your practice and in terms of your response to the ULAR and the ACR criteria that really doesn't utilize imaging in any right. form or fashion. What is your opinion on that? Well, it's a very interesting question. When the ULAR guidelines and ACR guidelines for classification or, or other classification criteria were first discussed at the big American meeting, um, imaging wasn't mentioned at all. And yet one of the criteria, one of the domains, looks at whether joints are swollen or not. And in fact, a, a very well-known uh, imager wrote to the committee and said, well, does, is it, does imaging count as a way to establish whether a joint is really swollen or not? And in fact, the wording of the classification criteria subtly changed after that into what actually went into print. And it is clear that imaging can be used as a means of determining whether a joint's swollen or not, because however skilled the fingers are of an investigator,
and there are some patients, and let's uh, be candid about it, a podgy patient, it's difficult to know is it fat or is it synovitis. Totally. But imaging will give you that distinction easily. Uh, and so it is already recognised that imaging has a role, uh, but I think the discussion you and I have just had really illustrates that imaging can go so much further, uh, and I'm convinced we'll see these advances come into regular practice yeah. in the years to come. I think so, and, and that's what I'm starting to feel the trend is, but not enough and not fast enough, but it never is. But Peter, thank you, that was great. Real uh, you know, uh, it was enjoyable and, as always, informative. Thank you.